Remember as a child how exciting it was when your best friend invited you over for a sleepover? Do you remember those days? Remember, remember how great that was? Well, I was 10 years old when my best friend Barry Davidson invited me over to his house for a sleepover. And it was in the backyard, okay? It was March, it was spring, we were going to get some warmth and we were going to set up this tent. I was so excited. So my dad takes me over there, drops me off. Barry and I get to work. We go out in the garage and we get the tent out of the rafters. Remember those old tents in the 60s that had the canvas and they were kind of green and they were musty and when you put them together they really smelled from last year when you put them together or put them away wet. Remember all that? <laughs> so we, we get this tent out. We build this fort out in the backyard. And we're just having a blast. We got sleeping bags and we got candles and we got all this, you know, comic books and food. But what was really important was we had Coca-Cola and 7-Up. Sounds, sounds kind of crazy, but my dad didn't let us have any kind of pop in our house. And Barry's dad was the vice president of 7-Up. So every time I went to... <laughs> Cha-ching! I was like, yeah, we're going to Barry's. This is great. So we had a wonderful night. It was really one of the most memorable nights I can remember in my life. But little did I know that my, my next day was going to be memorable as well, but for a different reason, a little bit more serious. So the morning came, and I hear this familiar but un, you know, unexpected voice say, Don, get your stuff. Let's go. And I thought, is that, is that my sister? So I poked my head out of the tent. Sure enough, my 15-year-old sister Margie's standing there. Let's, let's go. Get your stuff. I wasn't expecting her, so I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So I grabbed my stuff and started heading to the car. My dad owned a 63 white Chevy station wagon. And my sister had her learner's permit, and so I'm expecting to see my dad in the passenger seat. And uh, he's not in the passenger seat, so I said, uh, where's dad? Get in. Let's go. I'm like, okay. That was the first clue that that day was going to be memorable as well, but probably not for the same reasons. So we get in the car and we start heading home, I thought. But little did we know, uh, or little did I know, that she was taking me to my dad's boss's home, a guy by the name of Johnny Bennett. And so we get to Johnny Bennett's house and um, we go inside and we get to the kitchen and Johnny's like this and Joe, his wife, and the kids are all like this and there's tears in their eyes and I'm thinking, okay, here's my second clue that this is not gonna go real well. And that's when I learned that my dad had passed away in the evening. And I was super tight with my dad. I was like any 10-year-old boy with a great dad. He was my rock. He was my buddy. And uh, he's who I depended on for most everything. So I was like, like any 10-year-old. I'd be in shock. I, was, I, was, I didn't know what to say. My sister's there. And uh, my mom is not there, though. And uh, this was peculiar to me. And as hard as I took this news that my dad had died, my mom took it much, much, much harder. So uh, she was not even able to uh, function. So I was placed with my half-brother, Harmy, who's about 20 years older than I was. And um, I was with Harmy until August of that year when I was able to come back and rejoin my, wa my, my mom. My mom had been in... Um, a little rehab, and um, she was really having a difficult time. So when she got out of rehab, I was able to rejoin her in August. And um, it was bittersweet. You know, I was really thankful to be back with my mom. But I was in a home that my father was gone. My sister had um, been living at the YWCA downtown, and my brother was put into a foster home in Greeley. So here I was in this home with my mom, and uh, it just... Um, it was bittersweet, that's all I can say. And, and also my mom was obviously having a difficult time. She was uh, suffering from depression, she was drinking, and um, it just wasn't a good situation. So uh, I enrolled in school, went back to school, and um, all that came to a head in February, February 11th. I came home from school one day, and um, I love this uh, song called Venus. I don't know if you remember from this band called Shocking Blue. Anybody remember that? Yeah. And uh, I had this little 45 record and I came into my bedroom. I put the record on. I'm jamming out to Venus and I said, Mom! I called out for Mom and uh, no answer. And I uh, called out again, no answer. So I, I finally went over and I shut the record off. I started doing a little investigating and, and the next call I made was to my grandmother and to the fire department. And um, 
the fire department showed up and my mom had passed away in bed. So um, then I was like really uh, feeling alone. And I, I remember the um, fire department and the paramedics were there. My grandmother and my aunt showed up. I remember taking out the trash, walking past the old incinerators where we used to burn the trash, putting the trash in the can. I remember turning around, looking back at the house, and uh, that was the moment it really sunk in that I was alone. I was like, I'm totally alone. So I um, walked back in the house, and uh, my aunt came over to me, and she was comforting me and talking to me. And she said, how you doing? I said, well, I'm not doing very well. I don't, I, I don't even know what to say. And I'm, I'm feeling pretty alone. And she says, well, I'm going to take you. My aunt, my aunt Pauline, my dad's sister, said, I'm going to take you. Don't worry about it. You're, you're coming with me. And she said, it's not the best situation, but I think we can make this work. And what she meant by that was her husband was an alcoholic. And uh, so oh. we expected some rough spots. And uh, we, we did get some rough spots. So we hadn't been there at her house very long. Um, I hadn't been living there very long when um, the guy next door, his name was Bill. He was a friend of mine. And I uh, said to my Aunt Pauline, I said, I want to go out and take a little bike ride with Bill. Pauline said, um, I, I would really rather you not do that. I'd rather you stay close to home. Things are not good today. I said, OK. So um, I was over at Bill's house. We were in the basement. We were just playing. And I hear this blood-curdling scream. Like, oh, no. So I said, Bill, I got to go. So I ran up the stairs, bolted across the yard, went into the, my aunt's house, turned the corner by the kitchen. And here's my uncle with a loaded 30 odd six. And my aunt's got this hammer. And I'm like, oh, man, this is not good. And he turns around. He hears me. He turns around, points a gun at me. I'm out of there. I'm, I'm running out. And um, that was when my aunt knew that she had to make other arrangements for me. I couldn't live there anymore. So about two, three days later, um, a lady from the Department of Social Services shows up, sits me down on the couch, and um, she says, Donald, we're, um, we're going to take you out of here, and we're going to put you in a foster home. And I don't remember this specifically, because my aunt used to tell this story before she died, but she said, Donald, you looked right at that lady, and you said, if you put me in that foster home, I will run away. And, you know, I been through a little bit that year, and um, I don't think I was particularly in a good spot. And um, I'd also been to my brother's foster home up in Greeley, and it was not anything I would ever want to live in. It was just, it just had a really bad vibe. It was dirty, and uh, I think there was drugs going on there. I just, I just knew I wasn't going to go into that. So my aunt knew right then, at that moment, that this was uh, going to be a challenge to put me somewhere where I was going to be willing to go. So she had been a teacher at Cheyenne Mountain High School. And there was another gentleman named John Chamney that was a teacher there when she was. They were very good friends. She called John Chamney. And John Chamney was, at that time, the vice president of the Myron Stratton home. So she called John and said, John, I got a situation here. My brother's son is 10, you know, 10 years old, 11 years old, lost his dad, lost his mom. and." Um, he didn't want to go into foster care. John said, don't worry about it. We'll take him. We'll, we'll put him in the home. Well, she knew my reaction would be uh, not very good, so she crafted this little white lie, which at the time I was not very happy about. She said, you know, Ed's going to go into rehab, and we're going to put you in the home for six weeks, and then we'll bring you back. I said, okay, that's whatever. So we go out to the home one day, and we're in the home. We get the tour, and we see all the facilities, beautiful place. And we sit down, and we sit down with a supervisor there, a uh, superintendent named Jack Silas. And I remember Jack and my aunt are signing, and they're exchanging documents, birth certificates, blah, blah, blah. And um, at one point, Jack looks over at me and says, Don, welcome to the home. Go home, get all your stuff. Get moved in. We're so happy to have you. We're looking forward to it. I looked at Jack and I said, I don't know if it's really necessary to bring all my stuff. I'm only going to be here for six weeks. I mean, why would I go get all my stuff? I'll just get a few things, you know, and dead silence. I look over at Jack. Jack's looking down. My aunt's looking down. I'm like, okay, I'm thinking I'm having another one of these moments where this is not going to go so well. 
Jack looks back at me and says, Don, you're going to be here until you graduate from high school. And, you know, in my aunt's defense, I, I probably would have um, told her the same thing I told the lady from social services. I'll run away. So I was in the home. I was committed. They were my guardian, and um, I wasn't very happy about it, but I was there. But in the short time I was there, you know, I was there about a month, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And um, I remember my room, I was up on the second floor of the Independence Hall, if you've ever been there, and I had a window. And I remember sitting in that window one day and pulling my knees up to my chest, put my arms out like this. And I had one of those heart-to-hearts with myself, and I really had to come to a place of peace. And I said, either I have to accept this place and I have to live it and I have to in- engage it and make it my own and make it my home or I have to run. I have to get out of here. But I can't live here and not like it. You know, I can't do that. So I thought about it and I was looking out the window and there were some boys playing basketball below. And um, it was at that moment that I decided to stay in the home. And I accepted it and I said I'm going to embrace it. And it's it's totally different than anything I've ever experienced, but um, this is the lot that I've been dealt, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with it. And I have to say that was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my whole life, because the home was an awesome place, and um, they were, dis- you know, they had discipline, they had love, they had obviously all the creature comforts, you know, you got fed well, and you got clothed, and they had tons of sports and facilities, we had a hockey rink, we had a basketball arena. We had a swimming pool, we had all that. We had everything that a young kid could want. But um, the home put me on a path and it saved my life because uh, you can imagine where I was at when, when that whole thing happened. And I can totally understand why my aunt did what she did to get me in there. And the reason I'm talking about the home is this is uh, the 100 year anniversary of the Meyer Stratton home. And the Meyer Stratton home Winfield Scott Stratton, who was a miner, he lived here in town. He lived in a little two-bedroom house right at Kiowa and Weber. Was going up into the mountains and you know mining gold every summer, and he hit it big in the late 1800s, and I mean big. He'd been like Bill Gates today, okay? And uh, yeah, and here he was. He could have moved over to the Broadmoor. He could have bought every house on Portales Avenue if he wanted. But you know what he did? Instead of that, he gave his money to the poor. So that people like me, who were in a really rough spot, could survive. So that's the, that's the legacy of Win- Winfield Scott Stratton. And he named the home after his father, Myron. And um, I'm forever grateful to him. And I'm forever grateful to the people of the home. One of the gentlemen I met at the home was a guy named Michael Birdsong. I don't know if any of you remember him. He was a disc jockey. Yeah. And uh, when I... I think I was about 13, and Michael, um, he, of course, had all kinds of music, because he worked at the music station, but he also was a pretty good photographer. And uh, one day he put together this two-projector slideshow where he put all these pictures together, and he put music to it, and invited the kids in, and we're sitting there, and that just took me, it was just mesmerizing to me. So I was like, oh my God, I want to do that, you know? And he picked up on that. He's like, you like photography? I said, well, I like that. I, I want to do that, you know? <laughs> And so, you know what he did? He put me in his car and he drove me over to the Citadel to J.C. Penney and he bought me a $30 Instamatic camera. Just a little inspiration. You know, he just fed that little, little fire in me. And that was my first camera. I used that for about a year. And then there was another gal that worked at the home who um, had graduated from CC with a degree in art. She had a camera, and she loaned me that camera, and I used that. And one thing led to another, and pretty soon I bought my own SLR camera. And I entered a photo I did of the barn. We used to have a dairy out at the home, and I took this picture of the barn, and I entered it in a citywide photo contest and took first place, and I was like 15. And uh, that was it. I was like, okay, I'm hooked. I'm done. Squirt, that, that was my squirrels in the uh, dining room moment. Okay. So... Uh, and I ended up leaving the home, graduating from the home, and I went out to Santa Barbara, California. I got a bachelor's degree in photography at Brooks Institute of Photography. I came back, worked in the corporate world in photography, and then about 19 years ago, I started my own studio, and I still have Don Jones Photography today. So 
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. 